And that's not the only case of brutality and recklessness that we're hearing about today. A few hours north of Los Angeles, a U.S. district judge has ruled that police officers must face excessive force claims coming from Occupy Oakland. The protesters claim that police use unusually harsh tactics to disperse a peaceful group of activists who are speaking out against tuition hikes at the University of California in Berkeley. The Berkeley police used their batons to beat protesters who had linked arms in order to avoid eviction. Meanwhile, in New York, Occupy activist Michael Premio is, uh, was found innocent of assaulting a police officer when video evidence directly contradicted the New York Police Department's uh, claim that he had abused the officers. Here to discuss this case of Michael Primo, I'm joined now by Molly Neffel, a journalist at Radio Dispatch. Hey there, Molly. So uh, what did the video evidence ultimately uh, clear him of and what was shown in it? Sure. So um, Mr. Primo was facing uh, a number of, of charges, including obstructing uh, governmental administration, resisting arrest, and assaulting an officer. Uh, and uh, the officer in question ha had testified at, at the trial, claiming that Mr. Primo had uh, used SIF arms, had resisted, and ultimately uh, his uh, violent actions during alleged, his alleged violent actions had led to the officer um, uh, being injured and when the uh, actual tape of the arrest was uh, played in court it actually showed uh, that Mr. Primo uh, was on the ground he had fallen down in the scuffle of the protest and had uh, covered his his head to protect himself as he was on the ground and as he tried to uh, stand up was then tackled from behind by officers um, and uh, there was basically no ev uh, video evidence of what the uh, police officer had testified what happened. So quite a different story from what, what the NYPD prosecutors and also uh, the officer himself was saying. Now he was actually really lucky in this case that there was in fact video evidence to disprove what the officer and the prosecution were saying, but that's not obviously always the case. Uh, do you get the sense that the NYPD uh, lying on the stand is actually common practice or is this just an isolated incident? Well, there was another Occupy case uh, that happened um, uh, earlier um, in the past year uh, involving a man named Mr. Arbuckle, and that was also a case where the uh, police testimony contradicted the video evidence. Um, there uh, had been a police in that case, uh, a police officer testifying that uh, the defendant had been in the street obstructing vehicular traffic, I believe, and the video evidence um, showed that that wasn't where the uh, defendant was standing. So it's important to note that uh, that while Mr. Primo was found not guilty um, because there was this video, you know, meanwhile there are uh, you know hundreds more uh, Occupy cases and, and certainly thousands of cases uh, that that um, where there is no video. And uh, an important case, uh, you know, regarding police brutality would be uh, Jatik Reed, who was arrested last year by the NYPD uh, and violently uh, beaten by them while handcuffed. And because there was video evidence showing what happened, uh, the uh, NYPD ultimately dismissed um, what he was being charged with. But there was a, a number of, you know, discrepancies between the police report and the video. So, you know, sure. I can't speculate as to how often it happens, but it certainly, uh, it, you know, as Michelle Alexander has written in the New York Times, in a jury trial, you know, if you have a, a police officer testifying, uh, the, the jury might not have any reason not to believe that police officer's testimony if there's not video evidence there. Well, to, uh, to show Molly, the police, that, is, police that was going to be my question to you. Is do you think a jury is more likely to believe a police officer than a regular citizen? And do you think that that should should be the case? Should we just believe uh, what we're being told? Well, you know, we were talking about uh, LA, the LAPD earlier, and the you know the Rodney King video was so. Um, you know, so groundbreaking because finally here is here is video, and I think a lot of people in the communities of color in LA at that time were were not surprised to see that video um, because they knew that that was what was happening in their communities. And so, in terms of a jury, you know, I think it depends on the jury, but. Uh, you know, uh, as again, as Michelle Alexander's written, if you have a, a police officer on the one hand and a defendant on the other hand that that uh, is being discredited for a number of reasons, maybe he's being discredited because he's an activist, uh, you know, uh, or an Occupy person, uh, which against which there's this big smear campaign, or maybe he's a young man of color, uh, and the jury there might be all sorts of uh, reasons regarding um, you know cultural biases or. Media 
media representations that the jury might be more likely to believe the police officer than the defendant. But I think sure. that uh, Mr. Primo's case is important because it shows that that's not always uh, that's not always accurate. And we just have a little bit of time, Molly. But I have to ask you: Do you think we're going? Do you expect to see more video evidence used against police officers as a check on their power in the future? Well, that's, uh, it certainly has, I think, a great uh, deal of potential to change the way the trials go. You know, people have smartphones now. More people have access to video uh, and photos than ever before. The NYCLU has an app uh, that if you witness a stop and frisk happening, you can, you can videotape it. So I think that, uh, you know, that video will, will hopefully, if there's video available, as Mr. Primo's trial showed, it can, uh, it can serve as a force to uh, counteract the um, the power of the police. And of course, uh, videotaping police is legal in all but two states, so uh, we'll have to see how this plays out in other uh, cases dealing with Occupy. Molly Neifel, journalist at Radio Dispatch, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.